Shalom, Ruchim Abayim, and welcome to Shevi Impani, the Torah to the 70 faces of the Torah in also Sulam Yaakov. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Tetzaveh. The word Tetzaveh means and to command. Now, in this week's Torah portion, Tetzaveh is used in the imperative, which means that it carries a sense of urgency. I have subtitled this teaching, The Essence of the Menorah. Now, if you were able to join with me on my previous studies, specifically on Parsha Truma, I explained that Parsha Truma serves as an introduction or a gateway to the entire temple and korbanot system. And I explained there that contrary to many people's understanding, that when they read through these parshiot about the actual tabernacle and the kalim that's with inside the actual tabernacle and later on the korbanot or the sacrifices, that they are not just reading narratives in the Torah that pertain to you know, archaic information of the ancient temple system of Israel. I explained that these vessels and the Mishkan and the Korbanot are a microcosm of man. And I explained there in a two-part study uh, for Parsha Truma, which I subtitled the Shifa of Divine Parnosa, specifically how the Kerovim or the Cherubim on the Kaporet, the mercy seat, how they function as a microcosm for the Talmud Chacham, the teacher of the Torah, which is like the Kohen. I also explain in another study about the inner dimension of self-sacrifice, how the Mizbeach, okay, the outer altar, functions as a microcosm of man. And I also explain in another study that was called the indwelling of the Shekhinah, how the mish, Mishkan, okay, functions as a microcosm of man, specifically with the command, that God says in Exodus 25, 8, that they should produce for me a dwelling place that I may dwell, not bitochai in it, in it, but bitocham, that I will dwell in them. And then in the very next verse, in verse 9, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, Ani mar'e otecha. He says, let me show you, not Ani mar'e e, uh, ot, excuse me, Ani mar'e lecha, let me show to you, but he tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Ani mar'e otecha, let me show you, you, how these respective kalim are a microcosm a man. And so keeping with that same theme, I mentioned it as we progress through these parshiot for the next few weeks, but Zerah Hashem, with God's help, I will be exploring some of the other kalim or vessels to explain how they function as a microcosm of man. And also by the time we transition to the Chumash of Ayichor, the book of Leviticus, we will also learn how the korbanot or the sacrificial system, the various offerings also are a microcosm of man. And so, without further ado, we're going to focus our attention here on Parsha Tetzavei. And obviously, as you saw by the subtitle, The Essence of the Menorah, we're going to learn how the menorah is a microcosm of man. Now, what you need to know is that the majority of Parsha Tetzavei deals with what's called Big Day Kihuna. What is that? Big Day Kihuna. That represents the garments of the priesthood. Now, if you grew up surfing in California, you knew about the big kahuna, right? The idea of catching the big waves. Well, that idea is a Jewish idea. The kahuna refers to the koinim, refers to the priesthood. Okay, just a little side note there, free of charge. But the big day kahuna represents the priestly garments. However, the very beginning of the Torah portion does not speak about big day kahuna and also not the end of the Torah portion. Okay, the end of the Torah portion talks about the altar of golden incense, while the beginning of the Torah portion speaks about producing shemen za'it, pure olive oil for the menorah. And the question that many people ask, why are these two vessels, these two kalim, mentioned in this week's Torah portion when they should have been mentioned in Parsha Truma? Why is that? And there's always a reason. But let's take a look here at the Pasuk Shemot Exodus, chapter 27, verse 20 through 21. It says, Now you shall command. And once again, Tetzaveh is in the imperative. And that's a lesson within itself, okay? That you shall command the children of Israel that they shall take for you pure olive oil that is pressed. Katit Lamaor, Laha Alot Nir Tami, press for illumination to cause the Nir Tami. The Nir Tami is the eternal light, as we're going to learn today. It is the middle part of the menorah, to cause that eternal light to ascend. 
This is very important what we're reading here. And it says, That it shall be in the Ohel Moet, the tenor meaning, specifically outside the Parochet. So it's talking about the position of the menorah, that it's outside. Okay, at the partition which separates the holy of holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, from the Chechel, the sanctuary part, and it says that is near the testimony tablets. And a lot of this sounds very redundant and superfluous, and there's a reason why, which we're going to learn today. Okay, it's just trying to tell us that the menorah has a certain proximity to the Ark of the Covenant, but yet it's not in the same room with it. It's in the sanctuary part, not the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And so it goes on to say, Aharon and his sons, specifically the Kohenim, not the rest of the Levites, but only the sons of Aaron, it says that they shall arrange it from evening until morning before Hashem. It shall be an eternal decree for the generations for the children of Israel. So one of the things I want you to notice here, and I didn't highlight it yellow, but when it comes to the menorah, when it comes to producing oil for the menorah, that there is an eternal command. It says, olam tam, that this is an eternal decree that is binding for your generations. Now, how is that possible considering that we don't have a physical Beit HaMikdash? Okay, we don't have a physical menorah. Many of these things were destroyed or they have been concealed possibly deep in the Temple Mount in one of the subterranean chambers that was created in Shlomo's time that many of the prophets in the Sanhedrin knew about, but that's another topic to get into. But even then, I digress, what do we do? Well, if you paid attention to my previous teachings of Parsha Truma, you will know where I'm going with this, that these mitzvot are still binding today because they are microcosms of man. That's why I explained in my previous teachings on Parsha Truma that even without a physical Behamikdash, even without physical korbanot, the laws, the halakot that surround these vessels are still relevant because they pertain to you and me. That's very important. And Masachet Menachot, the sages explain that Moshe Rabbeinu, he had a very difficult time understanding how to construct a menorah until Hashem showed him a menorah made of fire. Menachot 29a, it says over here, menorah shall ish, that a menorah of fire descended Okay, you do min hashemayim from the heavens, and it says Moshe saw its format, and he fashioned it. Now this is very similar to what I talked about on uh, Shabbat Shechelim, that when it came to the machzit half shekel, okay, a half a shekel, not a whole shekel, that each Jew was required to give. That Moshe also had a hard time understanding how could something like money have the value of kapara, of atonement, because the Torah tells us in Parsha Kitesa with the Machsit shekel that when every Jew gave their respective half shekel, okay, it was a form of covering, a kafar for their soul. And there Hashem had to show Moshe what the sages describe as a, a matbil sha'esh, a coin of fire, to understand the concept of giving Okay, to have shekel, giving sadaka is akin to fire of enthusiasm. And so likewise, Chazal mentioned here, Moshe Rabbeinu had a difficulty in understanding the menorah. And so he had to be shown in the form of fire. He had to, be, he had to see the essence of what this represents. And so he's not just looking at the seven branch object that is, we call a seven branch menorah, but Hashem was showing him the intrinsic essence, the pinimiyut, the internal nature of what the menorah represents. Okay? He had to understand this, what it represents. The menorah, you have to understand, expressed its symbolic meaning through the light it disseminates. This is very important to understand as we go through the study, we're going to learn the definition of what light represents, especially in conjunction from the menorah. That way you don't come to some type of weird speculation or some type of philosophy or listen to somebody else's philosophy on the subject matter and they don't know what they're talking about. In all due respects, I'm not trying to be condescending, but it's very critical and imperative that you understand what the menorah represents as a microcosm of man. And so once again, the menorah expressed its symbolic meaning through the light it disseminates. Light represents the knowledge of God. Okay, that's very important because once again, this menorah was in the chechel, the sanctuary. Do you think Hashem needs a nightlight? He didn't need a nightlight. So the question is, 
why was it there? What's it represent? And you have to consider also, as we're going to learn through this teaching, there was other kalim or vessels that were associated with the menorah in that specific location. Shulchan, the lechem panim, the table of the table of showbread, the table of showbread, excuse me. Also, the altar golden incense was there. Then the menorah, and they were also positioned at a specific location, east, south, northwest, etc. That's very important. And so what we see here is that light within itself represents the knowledge of God in conjunction to the menorah. The menorah represents spiritual enlightenment, not physical light. That's important because throughout scripture, the word ner, okay, the word ner, which usually translates as lamp and also or, which is light, they are used as metaphors for the source and the dispenser of spiritual enlightenment. I'm going to say that again. Throughout Scripture, that's the Torah, that's the Nach, Nevi'in, Ketuvim, the writings, the prophets, the five books of Moses. The word ner, lamp and or, light, are used as metaphors for the source and the dispenser of spiritual enlightenment. In fact, the verb lehair, which means to give light, refers to spiritual enlightenment. We find this through a few pasuchim. I'll give you a couple here to take a look at, specifically Psalm 119, 105, which is dedicated to the not learning of Torah, by the way. David the Melech says, that your word is a lamp unto my feet, ve'or lintivati, and a light unto my path. Over in Mishli, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, Shlomo HaMelech says, Ki near mitzvah v'torah or, that for a mitzvah is a lamp, and the Torah is light. And likewise, in Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Beit Yaakov lechu v'nilecha be'or Adonai, house of Yaakov, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of Hashem. As we continue on, we also learn that ner and or, lamp and light, they are used as a metaphor for the source of growth in life also for unfolding and for flowering. So we see over here, for example, in Tehillim, Psalm chapter 132, verse 17, David Amalek says, Sham, atzmiach ledavid, that there, I will, there will I cause a horn of David to flourish, to sprout. And also I have prepared, he says, achiti ner lemishichi, also a lamp from my anointing. And by the way, this Psalm is where uh, the Anshe Knesset Haggadol, the men of the great assembly, drew the inspiration for the Semach David prayer that we say in the Shemoni Esrei when we pray for the coming of Mashiach at the Boni Yerushalayim, at the rebuilding of Jerusalem. We move further on over into Tehillim chapter 97, verse 11, and there it says, Or Zarua Lesadik, that light is sown for the righteous uh, and joy for the upright. And we continue on the Mishli, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 9. And it says, Or Sadikim, Yismach Vaner Rashaim, Yidach, Yidach, excuse me, the light of the righteous is joyful, but the lamp of the wicked is extinguished. So, what we see from these Pasukhim I quoted from and how they are used metaphorically is that a consensus of all the verses in Scripture dealing with light teaches us two components about light. The first component would be perception and enlightenment, while the other component of light, component of light, excuse me, is movement. Now, while light may travel at 300,000 kilometers or 186,400 miles per second, I'm not referring to the movement of light as it's known in science. We're talking about the spiritual understanding of light. The source of the light of the menorah is considered ruach, which means God's breath. God's spirit. The Ruach is what produces Chachma, Bina, and Da'at, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And it is the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of man, while it also motivates moral will and moral action. And so if we take a look at a few other Pesukim, we can understand this concept. For instance, if we go to Breshit, Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, regarding Yosef, Okay, when Paro learned about him, his ability to interpret the dream, he said to his servants, his Khartoumim, he says, Hamnitsa Chazei Ish Asher Ruach Elohim Bo. Who has the Spirit of God within him? And likewise, we go on to Shmo Exodus 35 31 regarding Betzalo's ability to help build the Mishkan. It says, Vayimale Oto Ruach Elohim Bechachma Bit Vuna. And Uvda'at, that he, 
meaning God filled Betzalel with the Spirit of God. And then we see something interesting, that a part of the Spirit of God is Chokhmah, wisdom, okay? Bina, understanding, and Da'at, knowledge. Now keep this in mind, because this also is very important when I come to a passage later on in the Navi Isaiah, Yeshiyahu, specifically Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and regarding the seven spirits of Hashem that rest upon Mashiach. So keep that in mind with this passage. If we move further up to Bamimbar, Numbers 27, verse 18, regarding Yehoshua uh, being chosen to secede Moshe, it says there, Vayoma Elanel Moshe, God says to Moses, Kachlacha et Yeshua binun, ish asher ruach bo. Take for yourself Joshua binun, a man in whom there is a spirit. So we see here the Spirit of God is in Yehoshua to, because as a leader, as a leader to take over. We continue moving on to Shmuel Beit, 2 Samuel, chapter 32, verse, 20, verse 2, 23, verse 2, excuse me, regarding how uh, David HaMelech testified how he's basically empowered by the Torah. Ruach Adonai Diber Bi, okay? The Spirit of God has spoken through me. Umilato el lishoni, his word is on my tongue, David says. Now, in other Pesukim or other verses, what you need to know is that spirit is not used as the source of knowledge, but refers to a force that moves the will to action. And that could be either to perform a good deed or it can be to perform a bad deed. For example, if we go to Shemot, Exodus 20, or 35, verse 21, we learn about the donations given to the Mishkan to build it. It says over there, that every man whose heart inspired him, okay, came, not camel, excuse the typo. Maybe they wrote a camel to it, I don't know. And everyone whose spirit, okay, nadiva, a nadiv lave, everyone whose spirit inspired him brought the truma, okay, et truma Hashem, the truma of Hashem for the work of the old Helmo or the tender meeting for all its labor and for all the sacred vestments. We go on to Devarim, chapter 2, verse 30, regarding the defeat of the king of Cheshbon. Moshe said there, Velo ava Sichon melech Cheshbon. But Sichon, the king of Cheshbon, he was not willing to let us pass through. And therefore what happened? Ki hiksha Adonai Elohecha et rucho v'imet et levavo. That Hashem, your God, hardened his spirit and made his heart stubborn. Similarly like what God did to Paro. In order to give him into your hand, like this very day. And we know the story that the Jews conquered the area of Cheshbon, and that became the area on the east of the Transjordan uh, area, okay, across the Yardin, which became the territory of half of Manashe, the tribe of Manashe, uh, Ruvain, and also of God as well. And so if we continue on here, we also see in uh, Shoftim, Judges chapter 9, verse 23, we learn regarding the conflict between Avimelech and Shechem. It says, Vayishlach Elohim Ruach Ra'ah, God sent an evil spirit, Bain Avimelech, between Avimelech, Uvein Ba'alei Shechem, and between the leaders of Shechem. Likewise, if we go up to Shoftim, Judges 11.29, we learn regarding the power God placed on Yiftach. It says, Vati El Yiftach Ruach Adonai, then the spirit of Hashem, okay, came upon Yiftach. We go over to 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 5 through 7, we learn about uh, um, basically regarding God killing the king of Ashur, Sennacherib, in his own land. And it says over there, Vayavu'u avdei ha-melech cheschiyahu el yeshiyahu cheschiyahu, or Hezekiah the king, his servants came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, because this, if you don't know the context of here, they were concerned that Sennacherib was the one responsible for basically coming upon the northern tribes of Israel, uh, casting them out, and bringing in foreign individuals in which he mixed them together. Um, many of those people would later identify as the, uh, the, uh, the Samaritans, okay? Then there was a concern with Hezekiah, Hezekiah that Sennacherib would continue uh, uh, to march to the beat of war by going to Judea 
and to conquer Judea with the Jews, etc. But after the Jews prayed and are seated, etc., Isaiah comes to give them a message that, listen, this guy is going to die in his own land, so don't worry. So it goes on to here. How is he going to die? This is what Isaiah says. He says over here, Chomar Adonai, so says Hashem, that you, al do not need to be frightened. asher, shamata asher, gidfu melech ashur otso. Okay, do not be frightened by the words that you have heard by which the attendants of the king of Ashur, of Assyria, have said to me. Because what's going to happen? Hineni noten bo ruach veshama, shemua veshav, it says leratso, vehit palatif, becher beratso. God says, Behold, I am placing a spirit within Sanhera, a spirit, a ruach. And he will hear a report, some type of a lashon hara, some type of false report. He will return to his own land, and I will strike him down by the sword. In his own land. And we do know that is what happened to Sancherav Yamach Shemo. We go on to Psalm 100, uh, not Psalm, but yeah, Psalm 51 12, in which David Hamelech, after sinning with Bathsheba, he pleaded with Hashem, Ruach Nachon Chadesh Bechebi, renew within me a firm spirit, uh, David says. Put a spirit that moves me to Shuva, a spirit that moves to a commitment to your Torah. And so what we see here, is that these pasukim speak about a movement, okay? A movement either to do good deeds or a movement to bad deeds, such as an evil spirit coming upon a person. Now, there are many pasukim where spirit denotes that aspect of our emotional life, which we call mood, and it describes the manner in which we express our attitude toward our surroundings, our satisfaction or our displeasure, or our sympathy for someone or something, or, or our, ath uh, or our athepy uh, to someone or something in that matter. And so in this situation, spirit denotes the element that prompts our decision for good or for evil. In fact, the Torah tells us that when Esau married the two Hittite women, okay, that his parents became bitter because of what he did. Genesis 26, 34 through 35, it says over there, Vayhi Esau ben Arba'im Shana, that when Esau was 40 years old, Vayachach Ishei et Yehudit bat Be'ari, that he took a wife, Yehudit, who is the daughter of Beri, the Hittite. Now the irony that she's a Hittite, but her name is Yehudit, which means a Jewish woman. <laughs> I didn't know the Hittites had Jewish women in those days, but just also goes to show you. And also he took uh, Basmat Bat Elyon, Basmat, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And look what it says. It says, Vatien Morat Ruach Liyitzach Urufka. They cause a bitter spirit in Yitzach Urufka. They were not happy that their eldest son married these two Goyesha women that were forbidden, okay, from the children of Abraham. But Esau did it because he was off the derech. And we see the result is this, is that it caused a spirit, okay, morach ruach, a bitter spirit, liyitzach urifka, inside of Isaac and Rebekah. Now, the Tanakh tells us that the story about Hannah, right, we know the story she was barren. And over there, the Tanakh mentions that Hannah informed Eli, the high priest, that when he saw her praying and he thought that she was drunk, that she responded to him by informing him that she wasn't drunk, but that she was praying from a very sorrowful spirit. Shmuel Allah for Samuel, chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. Okay, Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Remove your wine from yourself. And then Hannah responded, and she says, Lo Adoni, no, my master. She says, Isha keshach ruach anoki. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. The word keshat here, kesha means something very difficult, something's very burdensome. Okay, a very difficult, sorrowful spirit, she says. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Rather, she says, I have poured out my soul, lifnei Hashem, before Hashem. And so what we see in relation to all of these pasuchim, all of these verses dealing with the word ruach or spirit, Scripture unequivocally confirms that the term ruach has two aspects. What are those two aspects? They could be considered theory and practice, or perception and volition, enlightenment and motivation to actions. Okay, that's how we can understand it in those terms right there. And so from this assessment, 
the term Ruach, we learn that the menorah in the sanctuary is symbolic of these aspects. That is crucial for you and I to understand if you want to know how the menorah is a microcosm of man. Now, on that note, I want us to take a look over in Sefer Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. And over in Sefer Zechariah, the prophet was shown a vision of none other than a menorah. And the Tanakh says that Zechariah was very confused by the menorah, similar to how Chazal explained that Moshe Rabbeinu was confused by the construction of the menorah that I quoted from earlier in Menachot 29a. And there the Tanakh mentions that the Malach explains to Zechariah what the menorah signifies. Pay close attention here. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. It reads over there, And he, the angel, said to me, What do you see? He says, Listen, I see a menorah that's made entirely of gold. And what is with it? He says, Kula vigula el rosha. He says that uh, with its bowl on its top, I see vishivia nerotecha alecha. I see its seven lamps that are upon it. And he says, Shiva vishivia muksa chot. And there are seven ducks, okay, for le nerot asher el rosho for each of the lamps that are on top. Now, one of the things I want to say here before we continue with the rest of this pasuk. You need to keep in mind that whenever a Navi, okay, comes with a nevua, a form of prophecy, or some type of uh, concept that's being discussed in the Torah, okay, you have to understand that the Nevi'im are, are not infallible within themselves. That the words of the Nevi'im, the concepts and the visions they see, have to be traced to the Torah, to the five books of Moshe. And so obviously in this case, when Zechariah, okay, is being shown a menorah, we're learning, obviously, about the menorah that's with inside the Beit HaMikdash. But you have to keep in mind, Zechariah is from the school of Jews who come back from the exile of Bavel, him and Ezra, the Anshei Knesset HaGadol, the men of the Great Assembly. Therefore, there was no more menorah. The menorah was gone, okay? It was destroyed by Bavel, maybe kidnapped by them. Who knows where it's at today, right? But when they came back to Eretz HaKodesh and they were to reconstruct the temple, which would become the... Um, the actual foundation of the second temple later completely remodeled by Herod, okay, uh, you have to realize they didn't have a menorah. And so when he's seen this vision, you got to consider the timeline that they didn't have any of the respective Kalim, nor did they have a Beha Mikdash standing. And so this is why the, the, the Zechariah, even though he is a respective man of God, he does sit in the actual seat of Moshe Rabbeinu as a part of the actual Jewish leadership. He's also very dumbfounded because they've been in exile for so many years, and now they're coming back to start rebuilding the Beha Mikdash, Yerushalayim, and things of that nature. So I just wanted to point that out, because whenever we read these concepts in the prophets, whether they're major prophets or minor prophets, these concepts are not isolated. These concepts are rooted in the Torah, period. And that's why I want to say that in respect, especially for uh, those of you who come from Christian backgrounds, who have a tendency, who, who have a background where the tendency is to look at concepts in the prophets and try to isolate them to, uh, to marginalize them to events that are happening in the future. You have to realize that the things in the prophets are rooted in the Torah. Jewish history is cyclical. Okay, and many of the things that happen in the prophets actually serve as what we would call a perush, a commentary to many of the things that we find in the Torah. So just please keep that in mind. Nonetheless, let's digress back to the verse at hand. And so we see here that the prophet says, hey, this is a menorah. And then it goes on to say afterwards that there is also ushnaim zeitim alecha, echad mimen, okay, hagula echad el, it says somula, that there are two olive trees over it, one to the right of the bowl and one on the left. It's also very important. And it says afterwards, I spoke up and I said to the angel who was speaking to me, and he, look what he says over here. He says, Ma, Eli Adoni, what are these, my master? What am I looking at? Vayan Hamalach. And the angel who was speaking to me answered me, and he said over there to me, Halo Yadata, Ma, Ma, Elif, Vayomer Lo Adoni. The angel says, You've got to be kidding me. You're Zachariah. You don't know what the heck this is. Zachariah, by the way, was not like some average, you know, Am Ha'aretz. He was not a simpleton. Okay, he, he was a part of the Anshei Knesset Haggadol, the men of the great assembly, in which the transmission of Torah flowed through. He was a, you know, he was a constituent with Ezra, 
Ezra HaKohen, the priest, Ezra the Sofer, the scribe. So this guy wasn't just nobody. He was somebody. And the angel was like, you got to be kidding me. You don't know what you're looking at? You don't know what you're looking at. And he says, Lo Adoni, no, my master, I, I don't know what I'm looking at. Then he goes on to say, Vayam Vayomer, Elan, he spoke to me, Lemur, saying, Zedavar Adonai, El Zerubavel. This is the word of Hashem to Zerubavel. Now, who's Zerubavel? He's a descendant of David HaMelech, which means he's a Messianic candidate. God says to him, Lo Bechayil, Velo Vechoach. It is not through force nor by power. Ki'im Beruchi, but by my spirit, Amar Adonai Sevaot, says Hashem, the master allegiance. Now, this is a very important passage because this response from the angel is an answer. It's an interpretation to what Zechariah was seeing. In other words, that this interpretation, the Word of God to Zerubbabel, is an interpretation of what the menorah represents. It's showing Zechariah how the menorah is a microcosm for man. And here in this pasuk, the menorah with its seven lamps is a symbol of God's Spirit. And this symbol is so obvious that the angel had to rebuke Zachariah for not understanding what he was looking at. Because once again, Zachariah is not a nobody. He's a Navi, okay? And therefore, he should know what this means. But we can see here that if someone like Zachariah just perceived the menorah as a menorah, just as a, as a vessel, as an object that would be associated with the Beha Mikdash, Zachariah didn't know the inner essence of the menorah. That says a lot. Because if someone like Zachariah couldn't understand, how many of us can understand what it means? And I want you to notice how the verse mentions that there were two olive trees standing to the left and to the right of the menorah. What's that about? What did we just read for the beginning of this week's Torah portion? This week's Torah portion says that there is a command to produce Shemen Zait Zach, pure crushed olive oil for what? For the menorah. So contextually speaking, the olive trees in Zechariah's vision has to do with God's desire to rebuild the temple. But to rebuild the temple, he must rebuild the vessels of the temple, which represent the individuals of the Jewish nation. And in this situation, Zerubbabel represents that menorah. He is the Messianic candidate who is the descendant of David HaMelech. Because the menorah is nothing more than a microcosm of man. Israel's ability to succeed will not come from a military force or strength, as it says here. Lo bechayil velo vechoach ki im beruchi. Not by force, not by power, but by my spirit, God says. And what do we know about history at this point in time for the Jews? Is that God inspired Darius with a ruach, a spirit, to move on behalf of the Jewish people where he allowed them to return to Eretz HaKodesh and to start the construction of the Beit HaMikdash. And so we see that Hashem's word was addressed to Zerubbabel, who was the leader of the Jewish people. Zerubbabel's role was not to simply teach the Torah to God's people. He was not to teach them God's will, like sit there with a Torah scroll or a chumash and talk about this and talk about that. No. He was to recognize it himself and to carry it out himself. He was to be a living example to the people, to be a living Torah to the people. He was entrusted with the task of laying the cornerstone for an edifice towards which the fullness of divine providence was directed. Now, where else do we see the representation of the menorah in relation to God's Spirit in Scripture? Think about it for a minute. You don't have to think too hard. Zechariah is a minor prophet. There's only one other place, and it's a major prophet, that Zechariah, really what he's being shown, is not new, because it was already shown to another prophet before. Who is that prophet? That prophet is Yeshiyahu. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. We read over there, Vayatsa choter migeza yishai v'netzer misharashav yifre. A staff will emerge from the stump of Jesse, Yishai, the father of David, and a shoot will sprout from his roots. Now look what it says here in yellow. Ruach Adonai, Ruach Chachma, Uvina, Ruach Eitza, U Givura, Ruach Da'at, Ve'yirat Adonai, the Spirit of Hashem, 
will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of strength, of knowledge, and fear, Yerat Hashem, a fear, a reverence of Hashem. I want you to notice here, how many spirits are resting here on the servant of David? Seven. Seven. Now remember I talked about earlier with the passage of Betzalo, that there was a ruach of da'at, of chokhma abina. Okay? That's the same concept here. And so what you have to understand is like in Sefer Zechariah, we see in Isaiah that the menorah, this is what it is, the seven spirits of Hashem correspond to seven nerut of the menorah. Here in Isaiah, the menorah symbolized by God's Spirit is not just a source of theoretical knowledge and perception, but the source of both perception and action. And so in both passages, in Zechariah and Yeshayahu, these passages are messianic in nature. And what both verses reveal is that the Mashiach will be symbolic of the menorah. And I want to say this very uh, politely here for my non-Jewish audience that comes from a Christian background. I know that this passage in Christianity is interpreted as a passage to justify the doctrine of deityism, that Jesus is God. Because it says here that the Messiah will have all these things from God on him, and that means he's God. That is wrong, okay? And I'm going to show you that here today. Because the menorah is a microcosm of man. It's not just limited to the Mashiach, but it pertains to all of Israel. And this passage, as it alludes to the Mashiach, and, and over in Zechariah, as God is speaking to Zerubbabel, the Mashiach would be the leader of Claw Israel. He will demonstrate by his lifestyle how we are all to conform to the ideal concepts of the respective vessels in the tabernacle, in the temple, since they are a microcosm of us. He will show us and demonstrate that through his lifestyle. It's very important to understand, and I will demonstrate this as we go along. Now, the question that needs to be asked, that if the light born by the menorah symbolizes the spirit of understanding and action bestowed by God upon man, what is the relationship of the menorah to the light that it bears? Okay, I'm going to make, raise that question again. Now, I want you to take a look here at the image of the menorah as it was designed in the Mishkan in the Beha Mikdash. If the light born by the menorah symbolizes the spirit of understanding and action bestowed upon God by man, as we just learned from Zechariah and Isaiah. What is the relationship of the menorah to the light that it bears? When we look at the menorah's physical form, we need to take note of its articulate design. Okay? The design of the menorah is not random. Just like any other design on any other vessel is not random. As I explained this in my previous teachings on Parsha Truma, specifically with the Mizbeach, okay, and why the Mizbeach is described with its height, its width, okay, its width, and all the various measurements that we tend to think are boring. We have to pay attention to those things. Because as I taught with the Mizbeach, when it comes to the Korbanot, the respective offerings, Hasham, Chatat, Ola, etc., the Kohen would take the blood of those different offerings and apply it to different locations on the Mizbeach. It was conveying a message to the individual who brought it. And as we're going to see today, that message also brings a deeper message because as they look into the Hechel, the sanctuary where the menorah is at, the Shulchan, etc., there is another message being conveyed to the individual. This is important because nothing is by accident. You have to pay attention to all the actual minor details in the Torah, even if they seem boring. The design of the menorah is not random, okay? Every design of the menorah has a deep symbolic meaning. As you see on your screen, from its flowery base that's called the Yerech, all the way to its almond-shaped cups, okay, which is the, the Giviyah, okay? The Torah describes the menorah as a tree that is shooting up from its roots. Thus, when we rem look at the description in Isaiah, okay, Isaiah 11, 1, it says over there, V'yatsa choter migeza yishai v'netzer misharashav yifre. A staff will emerge from the stump of Jesse, and a shoot will sprout from its roots. Okay? The menorah is, is seen as a tree shooting upward from its rootstock. That's how Isaiah describes it. That's how the Torah is conveying that understanding to us. You have to understand that the menorah is the only vessel 
out of all of the vessels in the sanctuary that is made entirely of a single gold unit. Now, yes, as I explained in my teaching, with the cherubim on top of the kaporet, that whole unit was made of gold, but you have to keep in mind that was just the top, the kafar, the covering of the actual rest of the Aron Habrit. And if you study there, okay, in Parshat Shruma about the Ark of the Covenant, you'll know that it was overlaid with gold on the inside, overlaid with gold on the outside, okay? So it wasn't made strictly of pure gold like the actual kaporet with the cherubim. The menorah, on the other hand, is the only unit that is made of pure gold, okay? And so what does this tell us? This tells us that the menorah represents firmness, it represents perseverance, and it represents immutability. The menorah has seven lamps, right? Seven lamps, which signifies the spirit nurtured, okay? represents the spirit which is not one-sided. It's seven. And technically, the menorah is really one branch. It's the middle, the near tamid, also called the western lamp in rabbinical writings. But you have three lateral branches to the right and three lateral branches to the left. So when we look at the seven-branch menorah, what we see here is that the spirit that nurtured it is not a one-sided spirit. Rather, the spirit of the menorah manifests itself in a rich diversity of aspects, which are not mere diversity, but the totality of human activity in the realm of spiritual perception and moral volition. Thus, that's what the three lateral or the, three, the two lateral branches, the left and right lateral branches represent, perception and volition. Now, in addition to the diversity of the menorah, we learn that the lamps also symbolize harmony and unity. I'll bring the image back up on the screen here for you. And what we see here is that the menorah is the only vessel out of all the vessels in the sanctuary that is made entirely of gold. Now, yes, in last week's Torah teaching, come on, bro, start over five, four, because I have to, one. And what we see here is that the menorah is the only vessel out of all the vessels in the sanctuary that is made entirely of gold. Yes, I pointed out last week in Parsha Truma that the cherubim that are on top of the kaporet, the mercy seat that goes on top of the Aron Habarit or the Ark of the Covenant, that was made entirely of gold. However, since it serves as the top part of the Ark, it's not uh, a unit by itself. You would notice in the Torah it mentions the Aron Habarit was also composed of wood and it was overlaid in gold. So it's not considered the only uh, a unit within itself that's made entirely of gold like the menorah. The menorah is the only unit that is made purely of gold. And so this tells us that the menorah represents firmness, perseverance, and immutability. Now the menorah has with its seven lamps, right? Which signifies that the spirit that nurtured it is not one-sided, okay? Rather, what we see here is that the spirit of the menorah manifests itself in a rich diversity of aspects, which is not mere diversity, but the totality of human activity in the realm of spiritual perception and moral volition. And in addition to the diversity of the menorah, we learn that the lamps also symbolize harmony and unity. Well, what do I mean? Well, the central lamp, also called the western lamp by the sages, or sometimes the shamas, in the Torah is called the Nir Tamid, that would shine directly upward and it would point towards the Kodesh HaKodeshim, towards the Holy of Holies, okay? While the other lamps on the left lateral and the right lateral branches, they would actually oscillate and they would incline like a, like a pyramid towards the actual Nir Tamid light. And so while the six Nerot were lit, they would actually point, oscillating up at an angle towards the actual near Tamid. And the reason why they would oscillate towards the near Tamid is because the central lamp was the ultimate aim of all the other lamps of the menorah. The seven lamps rest on seven branches. Each branch does not have its own separate as what's called a kane, a stem. Rather, all the branches extend from the middle stem of the central lamp as you see there on your screen. And so from this, we learn that the central lamp is not only the unifying aim, but also the starting point of the other branches and the other nerot. And so that means that when studying the menorah, we have to consider that it's not simply a seven-branch menorah, but that it's a menorah with six branches, because the menorah itself is only that middle yarek, that near tamid, that central column 
the other six nerot, the other six branches, the three left lateral, three right lateral branches, okay, they strive to actually imitate, they, tr they strive to emulate, to become what that central lamp represents. And this is interesting because what does the number six represent? Six is symbolic of the world of creation. Man was created in the sixth day. Well, seven is symbolic of God's spirit who completed the creation process. And as I explained before, the Ruach, the spirit symbolized by the light of the temple menorah is understood in a dual sense. On one hand, it is the source of perception or the element that enlightens. And on the other hand, it is the source of movement or the element that mobilizes. And in man, since the menorah is a microcosm of us, in us, this duality takes the form of perception and volition. That's the inner secret behind the, the two lateral branches, the left and right lateral branches. And so the exercise of these two faculties, perception and volition, demonstrates the presence of the human spirit. The two sides of the menorah, okay, the six branches, the lamps, the left, three left and three right, symbolize the duality of man's spiritual perception and morality. In fact, what I want to break this down for you to understand, to give you a little uh, bird's eye view on this, okay? You have to understand this, as I explained from Parsha Truma, okay? We'll come back to this image right in one second. I explained in Parsha Truma, the study I did called the inner dimension of self-sacrifice, how the Mizbeach is a microcosm of man. I explain there the significance, once again, of the measurements which seem so boring to many of us when we read about the actual Mizbeach. But I explain in that teaching that the actual Mizbeach had three levels to it. And those three levels were important because they would determine where the blood of the respective korban or sacrifice would go on the Mizbeach by the Kohen. And that every korban was different from the other and also conveyed a message to the individual brought it. Now, on top of that message that was being conveyed to the conscience of the individual who brought that korban, there was another message being conveyed. Imagine sitting in the Beit HaMikdash thousands of years ago. This section here is called the courtyard of the women. And there you would ascend this 15 steps, the dukin, the platform as it was called. And right behind that door, you would enter into the courtyard. And in the courtyard, there is the Mizbeach, there you see the altar, and this is a rendition of the second temple, mind you, okay? And so, in the courtyard, okay, that's the north part, we're at the north facing south, and obviously what we see over here is that uh, we have the Beha Mikdash, which is uh, to the west, and so we will be standing uh, from the east facing west, and you see the Kior, the, the, the water, okay, where the Kohani will wash their hands and feet, that's directly to the north, and then the Mizbeach is towards the south. When your animal was being sacrificed there, you would witness, if it was an Asham, a guilt offering, a Chatat, inadvertent sin offering, an Ola, an elevation offering, that the Kohen would take the blood and put it at a different location on the altar. Not only would you understand a message being conveyed to you regarding how the animal was shecht, how it was slaughtered, but also where the blood was placed on the altar. The silent message the Kohen conveyed to you without speaking a word would be pressed deep upon your psyche. Immediately before you, you see the actual temple, the Beit HaMikdash. And there you see the door that is open. And Chazal tell us that the door would remain open during the sacrifices. And inside, the individual would be able to see the hallway that would lead to another what would be hallway, but that is the hekel, that is the sanctuary, where they would be able to see the menorah, they would see the shulchan with the lechem panin, the bread of places, they would also see the mizbeach sel zahav, the altar of golden incense, and then they would see the pahokit, the curtain that separates the holy of holies. They wouldn't be able to see into the holy of holies, okay, but they would be able to see inside. You have to understand, while they're bringing their korban, they're looking at all of this simultaneously. They're taking in the message of, their, of the respective korban that they brought, 
whether it was Asham or as an Ola, and as I explained in Paras Truma, once again, where the blood went, all that conveyed a message to the conscience of the individual who brought it. And then as they're watching the blood being put to a certain part of the Mizbeach, and where the altar, or where the Kohen would ascend on the altar of the ramp, or he would toss the blood on the base of the ramp, his eyes would be directed then to the Beha Mikdash, in which he would look inside the Hecho. And in the Hecho, he sees the menorah. He sees directly in front of the menorah, the Lechem, the Shulchan Lechem Panim, the table of the showbread. He would see the altar of the golden incense. Adjacent behind it, immediately is the Parochet, which he knows has the Ark of the Covenant, that has the Torah inside of it. What is happening here? What is the experience that the individual is gaining? He's gaining some awesome revelation, I can tell you that. And Bezrah Hashem, hopefully each and every one of us will receive some revelation today. Through the central branch, okay, the near tamid, man's spiritual perception and morality is inseparable. They are not separate. This is a problem with humanity today, where some people try to do a religious thing on one day of the week, but then during the Monday days of the week, they're another individual. The Torah says you do not have a bipolar personality. You cannot be a schizophrenic and serve Hashem. You have to be the same inside and outside. That's one of the deeper lessons about the actual Arun Habarit, the Ark of the Covenant, that it was overlaid with gold on the outside and inside. You must be the same individual as you are privately as you are publicly. Do not be a hypocrite. This is the same concept with the central branch of the menorah. Man's spiritual perception and morality is to be inseparable. When the two lateral branches reach the top of the menorah, the right and left lateral branches, they direct their light towards that central lamp, towards that central branch, which is the near tamid. Once again, the flames oscillate upward, incline like a pyramid. The central lamp symbolizes the spirit that ascends to God, which seeks to be fostered by His Torah. And so this teaches us that all perception and volition originates from one common root and then unites to aspire one common gold. This root from which our soul ascends to God is considered in Hebrew, Yerat Hashem. It says reverence of God, but more like perception of God. What do I mean? Yerat Hashem is the highest level of perception, what brings with it the highest form of morality. On Sunday mornings, we recite from the Shir Shel Yom, the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 24. And over in Psalm 24, David HaMelech asks a rhetorical question, in which he asks, Mi Ya'alei Bahar Adonai, who can ascend the mountain of Hashem? U Mi Ya'chum Bamakom Kocho, who can be established in that holy place? Niki Kapayim, one with pure hands, Uvar Levav, and one with a pure heart. It is the spirit in which the perception of the highest truth is intertwined with the doing of the greatest good. And this is why, friends, it is without any coincidence that the word Yare in Hebrew, which means fear or reverence of, is closely related to the word Ra'a, which means sight means perception. The relationship between fear of God and perception of God finds expression in the combination of Yare with the particle et alav tav, which perform Yerat, okay? Yerat, which means fear of reverence of Hashem of God, or Yerat Hashemayim, hash fear of heaven. And so this teaches us that our reverence of Hashem is based on our perception of Hashem. How do you and I perceive Hashem if He's immaterial, incorporeal, invisible? We perceive Hashem via His Torah. This is important to understand when you understand the lateral position of the actual Neirot or the menorah. According to Chazal, the menorah was positioned south of the shulchan, of the bread of the table of faces. So here's an image of the east facing west, as if the doors were open and you were in the courtyard. This is what you would see. You would see the menorah to the left, which is the south side, the shulchan, which is directly to the right, that's the north side, and directly to the west is the parochet, the curtain that uh, separates between the sanctuary and the holy of holies. And here's another image here from the south directly north, so the light of the menorah would cast, okay, directly in front of the actual lechem panin, the table of showbread, okay? And here's another image from the actual other side from the north looking south, okay, that you would see this image. 
And here's another one, another perspective, a little broader perspective, okay, that you'll see here, the menorah. Now, once again, what's the purpose of the light? Does the Kohanim need a, light, a night light to go eat some bread in the middle of the night? I don't think so. Look at the location. Look at what they represent. Look at each of these respective Kalim, okay? Look at them. So based upon this layout, it will reveal that the lateral branches of the menorah, okay, facing east, the three right lateral that face east towards the courtyard where the korbanot were being done, okay? This is where the people would see from the outside to the inside. They would be looking west toward the Holy of Holies. And so what we see here is that the three left lateral branches are adjacent to the Holy of Holies. And altogether, the light of the menorah would cast north onto the lechem panim, the shulchan, the table of the bread of faces. What does all this mean? It's not there by accident, and there's a profound truth to it. According to Chazal, every direction, north, south, east, and west, has a deep meaning to it. The west side symbolizes the direction of Torah. The north side symbolizes materialism, which is associated with lechem, with the bread. The south side symbolizes chokhmah, wisdom, spirituality, which is where the menorah is at. And the east side, which is adjacent to the courtyard, that symbolizes an invitation to invite the nation of Israel to sanctify itself through dedication of God in His Torah. And this sanctification takes place on the east side, outside the sanctuary where the korbanot were being done. Because once again, the korbanot were symbolic of the people learning to die to their nefesh behemah, their animalistic desires and drives. So once again, taking consideration that when a person brought their, pers their respective korban, whether it's Ola, whether it's Asham, whether it's Chatat, they're watching something. There's a message being conveyed to their conscience. And then as they watch this, their eyes are directed into the actual sanctuary and they see the menorah, they see the bread, they see the altar of gold and incense, they see the parochia with the Holy of Holies. There's a lesson being conveyed here. What we learn from this format, friends, meaning what we learn of the menorah's position in the sanctuary opposite of the bread is that the spirit granted by God and fostered in His sanctuary is the same spirit that seeks God's nearness in His Torah and the covenant. That He, God Himself, established with Israel for the sake of the Torah. And so the spirit creates within us the awareness that places the entire material realm and the impress of its spiritual destiny and creates the moral volition and performance that implement the spiritual within the material realm. In other words, what that means, the reason why the menorah is positioned south of the shulchan and the shulchan is placed to the north is because the south, the menorah represents spirituality. The north, the bread represents materiality. The Torah is telling us that the material realm can have no meaning unless the light of spirituality is cast upon it. And likewise, spirituality can have no meaning unless it can utilize the material realm to reveal the will of God. This is why if you're a type of person who says, oh, I live in the Beit Knesset all day. I live in the Beit Midrash all day. I live in a church all day. I live inside some nook and cranny. I am protected in my spiritual safe space, like some of these secular people with their universities. You're no good to Hashem. You're no good living inside of a Hechel. You have to utilize the material realm with the spiritual realm. This is one of the secrets of why Yosef was so unique in his calling and why he was able to take over Mitzrayim, because he was able to fuse spirituality with physicality to reveal the will of God in humanity. Once again, the branches of the menorah, the right lateral, the left lateral, and together the lights casting upon the material world are to show us great insight, okay? Because the three right lateral branches, they're facing the courtyard where the korbanot is facing. What does that represent? That represents volition. And then the three left lateral branches, they're facing the parochit. They're adjacent to the Torah. And what does that represent? Perception, perception, volition. And so what that teaches us is that depending on how one perceives God via his Torah, will determine their volition when it comes to the material realm, how they will make money, how they will use money, how they would use their gifts for the kingdom of God. And so the Torah seeks its realization in the Jewish people, and the Jewish people seeks its molding of its character from the Torah.
that's very critical because when a person brought a korban, they brought a korban because they made it in a vera. They made a transgression. They misappropriated their free will, their time, and their money, and their energy. And so when the Kohen is going up the ramp, he's telling the individual, you have to continue to ascend the Har El, the mountain of God, which is what the top of the altar represents, as I explained in Parsha Truma. And then the message is being conveyed to him as he looks inside the sanctuary. He understands that he did not perceive God good enough for his Torah, and so he misappropriated certain things. But the Torah is still conveying a message to him. And so, friends, as explained in Sefer Zechariah, the menorah that the prophet saw was symbolic of God's Spirit. And in Isaiah, the Navi explains the nature of God's Spirit. And so the description of God's Spirit resting on the Mashiach in Isaiah 11 is the spirit of menorah. In fact, if you take Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, it designs a menorah. The verse is in the shape of a menorah. You see it right here. Okay, the seven spirits of Hashem are on the top of the seven Nerot. And the central column, the near Tamid, says Ruach, 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 Ruach. This whole staff of Jesse, a tree shooting up is what the menorah is. Once again, Isaiah, the spirit of Hashem, is characterized as a single entity containing six components. We'll go there again. Isaiah 11, 1 through 2. Vayatza choter migeza yishai v'netzer misharashav yivrei. A staff will emerge from the stump of Jesse. A shoot will sprout from his roots. The spirit of Hashem will rest upon him. What would be? Venata, excuse me. Venacha ala ruach adonai ruach chachma v'uvina ruach etza u'givra ruach da'at v'yirat Hashem. Perception of Hashem. Fear of Hashem. Powerful. If you go on to verse 3, verse 3 says, Ve'ha'richo Hashem. It repeats it again. Yirat Hashem, that He, Mashiach, will be imbued, ve'ha'richo, in, okay, the fear, be'irat Hashem. Not just the fear of Hashem, but in the perception of Hashem. The word over here, the first word, which is not highlighted in yellow, but it's in white, ve'ha'richo means to imbue means to imbue someone with spirit, to fill him with a spirit, to inspire him. And so according to Isaiah, the spirit of God that will rest on the Megizah Yeshai, the shoot from Jesse, is described in the fullness of seven aspects. And one of these seven aspects is singled out as the root of or the primary medium for all this spiritualization. And so similarly, in the case of the seven lights of the menorah, there was one light from which all the other lights were lit from. And so according to Yeshayahu or Isaiah, the bearer of the seven rayed spirit of God emerges like a shoot from one stock. On this bearer rests the one spirit of God with its six branch manifestations, Chachma, Bina, Da'at, etc. And so from this we learn that the Mashiach is going to teach man that the idea of human character, that the, the, he's going to teach, excuse me, the idea of the human character trait is to be cultivated as a bearer of God's spirit. Okay, that this trait is not something supernatural, but that this trait is innate within man. It's already there. This trait, okay, is acquired through man's potential within him. It's not acquired through other capabilities or artificially grafting into his personality. It doesn't come from the outside. It's already in him like a seed. It's there and it has to flourish up, which you're going to see in a minute that the menorah is akin to botany. You'll see this and be amazed in a second. And so this conveys to us the truth that everyone, not just Siddiquim, not just Mashiach, is capable of the spiritual development because the menorah friends is a microcosm of you and me. It's not like, oh, with this passage, as I said before, for those who come from a Christian background, Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, okay, is normally perceived as some type of proof text that the Messiah is God. That's not what this is. Isaiah, like Zechariah, they're ad-libbing the Torah. This is not new information to Isaiah. This is not some new piece. This comes from the Torah. The only difference is that it's a commentary to the Torah to understand the menorah. That's why the angel had to rebuke Zechariah. You don't know what this is, Zechariah? This is, a, this is a symbol of Zerubbabel, the messianic descendant of the King David. So Zechariah is doing nothing more than ad-libbing Isaiah 11. The function of the Mashiach 
is to demonstrate how the menorah is a microcosm of us. He's to demonstrate that because we have that same potential. That's why we're not supposed to idolize the Mashiach. He's not God, period. He's a righteous figure that eternalizes the Torah to demonstrate through the will of God in his life as a living Torah to teach us how to be a living Torah. That's very important for us to understand. The Torah says that the menorah must be hammered out of pure gold. Out of pure gold, as you see on the screen. Why pure gold? Zahav, or gold, is one of the purest metals in the earth. However, because gold can become susceptible to being tarnished, it's important for everyone to realize that they have within their natural abilities the potential to become a bearer of a light. This is why Moshe Rabbeinu and Zechariah could not understand the secret of the menorah. Because on a deeper level, how is it possible for you and me, for flesh and blood, to become a bearer of God's Spirit? All of us with all of our peko, our baggage, all of our problems. How in the world can we be a bearer of God's Spirit? That's why it's really easy for some people to read a passage like Isaiah 11, 1 through 2 and say, Wow, the Mashiach is God, right? He's a superhuman. Because it's easy to sit there and look at someone else and say, wow, they, they, they have supernatural powers. Because we don't see how it's, poten how it's possible, how we have that potential. But friend, I'm here today to let you know that potential is within us. It is within us. Everyone on his own level, with the faculties with which he is endowed, can reach the highest degree of moral and spiritual perfection to commensurate with his own level and abilities and thereby can ascend to the heights of his own moral and spiritual calling. If you don't think so, then friend, you are in a serious state of yush, of despondency, and you need to wake up. Now, when we look at the menorah, let's break down some of the key features of the menorah. The menorah is composed of an intricate design, and that's not by accident. That's why it's important to pay attention to the material that tends to put you to sleep. Because you're learning about yourself here, friend. You're not learning about some archaic museum piece that used to exist in Jewish history. This menorah is supposed to be forever, it says. And what do we see here? We see that the menorah is composed, okay, of what's called over here, you have parachim, uh, flowers. It's also composed of giviyecha, which is a givya, a goblet, a cup, which has like an... Uh, you know, a unique shape. Also, it also has over here kaftorecha or a kaftor, which is like a special knob. And what we learn here is that the position and numbers of these ornamentations are precisely specified and are so essential that the absence of one of them renders the entire menorah possible. Do you understand that? Just one iota. If one thing is missing, it completely makes the menorah invalid. And you may say, well, why so strict? Because we're not learning about some external uh, artifact. We're learning about you and me. This represents us. And therefore, if we're missing one single thing in our connection to Hashem, it makes our connection to Hashem puzzle and valid. And so we see that the beginning of the menorah starts from what's called the Yarech, which is the base. Now, if you were with me for my teaching on Hanukkah, I explained that the, the base the middle stem is called the Yerech, which also has a euphemism, a thigh in Hebrew, which is connected with Yaakov Avinu fighting the angel, etc. Okay, so go back and look at that Hanukkah teaching I did to get a, infinite, a unique revelation because in a way, I explained before that Israel and the Torah is described as kol ha-nefesh. They are literally called the soul, not kol nafsho, the souls. Every soul that came from out of Yaakov is called as, is described as a singular unity. Okay, because in a way, Yaakov represents the menorah that the souls that came from him are like the fire of a flame that extends to each respect of Nair. And if you ever notice, when you extend fire from one candle to the next, it never diminishes. It always expands energy. It never decreases energy. That's the secret of Yaakov and the souls of Israel. So just keep that in mind and go back and take a look at the teaching I did at Hanukkah. But nonetheless, I digress here. So the middle base here is called the Yerech. And if you look closely, you will see that at the, at the Yerech, at the base, there is none other than a Perach. There is a flower. At the very bottom, where the base connects with the central column, you'll see that there is a Perach. There is a flower. 
okay, from which the kane, the middle central stem, extends upwards to. And above the perech, you see a giviya, you see a cup. And then you see above that is a kaftor, a knob. And then there's another perech, another flower. It's important to understand what these designs mean, specifically in relation to each other, because they're not there for random chance, and they're not there for us to say, oh, wow, this is a nice piece of uh, artwork, you know, fabulous. Wow, buh Hashem. That's not there for that, friends. On the menorah, the design of the perachim, or the flowers, gives indication, listen closely, gives indication that the function of the menorah is about blossoming with light. What about the other designs? Well, giviyah, the goblet, okay? The giviyah is a vessel that is wide at the bottom and narrow at the top, okay? Or excuse me, it's wide at the top and it's actually narrow at the bottom. In fact, over in Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, he describes the giviyah as a large vessel in which wine is brought to the table and which is then poured into the cups, okay? So it served as like this container, like what you and I would probably call a keg in today's day for beer, but not identically like that, but it served as some form of keg for wine. Here in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 5, he says over there uh, that before the members of the house of Harechavim, okay, of the Rechabites, it says, Giviim, Meleim, Yain, Vechosot, that I place drinking bowls. Those drinking bowls is Giviim, okay? Okay, that's what it means, and filled the cups. And I said to them at the word, Shetu Yain, drink your wine, have a Lechaim to it as well, okay? So what we see here is something interesting. We'll bring the, the screen back up. That basically, Giviyah, according to its basic meaning, forms a contrast to the perach, to the flower. There's a contrast between the goblet and, a con and the flower, okay? What is that contrast, okay? It's very interesting, by the way, if you take a look at the word perach in Hebrew, the word perach comes from the root word perach, okay? Perach. And perach literally means to fly or to release, okay? And that's interesting because giviyah, on the other hand, giviyah refers to something, a container that collects something. So you're, you're, you're collecting something, but then a perach, the flower, or perach, means to release something. It's fascinating. So something has to do with collecting and something has to do with releasing. Hmm, interesting. So what are we learning here? From here, what we learn is that we go from the giviyah and then we ascend up to a kaftor. What's the kaftor? Okay, the kaftor are fruit-like ornamentations that protrude on the central shaft and also on the lateral branches as you see them coming off the central column. And so when we consider these parts of the menorah in their context, the giviyah, the kaftor, and the perach, we learn that they are components of one unified system. In fact, when considering that the giviyim Okay, the cups are supposed to be designed in the shape of shekhidim, which are almonds. We learn that the menorah has its roots in botany. Oh yes, in botany. That's interesting. That's not a coincidence. In botany, every normal flower consists of a central three parts. One is that it has a flower cup or what's called an outer covering, usually consisting of leaves. Two that there is a capsule which contains the seed germs and collects the pollen, which is called the fertilizing agent, which is through the pistil, which eventually becomes known as the fruit once it uh, matures. And three is the petals, okay, that blossom, which surrounds the stamens with their filaments. And hopefully you guys can see the image on the screen that describes the various parts of the anatomy on the, on the actual budding of a plant, okay? And believe it or not, this finds a correspondence with inside of the actual menorah. The anatomy of the flower corresponds exactly the three shapes of the menorah. The giviyah, the kaftor, and the parach, the cup, the knob, and also the flower. The top of the branches of the menorah consists of three giviyim, okay, three cups, and I'll bring this back on the screen. So there's three giviyim at the very top of the menorah. There's one kaftor and one perach, one knob and one flower. And from the perach then emerges the ner, the actual candles, okay, the nerot, the very, very top as you see there.
And this is interesting because if the menorah culminates in Giviim in the cups, and also the kaftorim in the knobs, and also the perachim in the flowers, and out of these perachim, out of these flowers, the light burns with the wick, and the burning in the wick of the menorah corresponds to the filament which bears the fertilizing pollen in the plant. So that means they're identical, that the very top of the menorah is similar to the filament of a plant. Coincidence? I don't think so. And so what we see here is that the giviyah and the menorah, as it relates to a flower, is a vessel that stops the, the sab from continuing to develop the branch and gathers in, uh, not the sab, but the sap, okay, that its, its function, okay, if you will, is to, is to um, the giviyam, I'll say that again, that the giviyam and the menorah, as it relates to the flower, okay, is a vessel that stops the sap from continuing to develop the branch and gathers in the sap at one point to form a new structure where the flower forms, the growth of the branch comes to an end. And so then the sap and the vital forces are collected into the givia, into the cup that produces the fruit. Now, the kaftor on the menorah, okay, the knob, will be considered the seed-bearing pod that appears to be on the plant, okay? That's what it will appear. It will be the seed-bearing pod that appears on the plant, as you see in the image here with the plant. Now, the seed-bearing pod is the place where the plant's whole wealth of material, the saps and vital forces, is transformed into seeds for the growth of a new plant. And it may have actually, uh, it's also without coincidence, by the way, I'm trying to say here, that the word kaftor, is actually a compound of two words, compound with the word kefit. Kefit literally means to bind or to knot together, and the word fatar. Fatar means to release. And so what we see here is that the energy for detachment and the release of life comes to them only through fructifying pollen. And so what's unique about this is that the perch, the flower of the menorah, will be considered the petals of the plant which protect the pollen filaments. And so in this sense, the word per constitutes the plant's wings of freedom. It's budding, it's flourishing. And that's why I mentioned before that it's no coincidence that the word per is from the root word perach, which means to fly or to release. And so the function of the per, the flower, is to release the seed germs within the pistil. What does this teach us? What does this mean to us? Friends, when our spiritual perception is focused on God's Torah, the perception of the three left lateral branches, it germinates within us the potential for life. Over in Parsha Baha'u'llah, the Torah enforces that the menorah must be produced, as it says on your screen here, Ad Yircha Ad Pricha Miksha He. It, from its very base, okay? Its very base unto its top, to its flourishing, and must be hammered, miksha he, out of one unit, out of one single unit. The Torah here connects the word miksha between hammering out the menorah from its yircha, its yirech, its base. And what is the base of the menorah? Since it's a, it's, a, it's a microcosm of you and me, the base represents our base desires, our carnality, our flesh, our yetzahara. And what is the pricha of the actual menorah? The top of it, the budding of it from perach flower? That represents our spiritual desires. It represents our soul's illumination. Why is that? Chazal over in the Midrash come along and to explain here the verse in, um, in, in Parsha Baha'u'llah. They say this teaches you, Kilomar, Ma Kashahila Sot. The word Miksha indicates how difficult it is to produce the menorah. Difficult to produce the menorah. What does it mean, difficult? The Torah acknowledges that it's not easy for the soul to illuminate with light, especially when dealing with the Yetzahara, when dealing with the Klipa, the shell of the body. But in order to successfully create an instrument of illumination, we must constantly hammer out the desires of the flesh, the darkness that seeks to put out the flames of spiritual desires. This is why the more one develops a sense of perception of Hashem's Torah, okay, which once again is why the menorah was adjacent to the ark, the three left lateral branches next to the actual parochet. They allowed themselves to become filled with Yerat Hashem. And as I explained before you the word, 
Okay, I explained before you before. Okay, the word yare, fear of, is closely related to the word ra'a, right? Ra'a, which means sight and perception. And so the relationship between fear of God and perception of Him finds expression in the combination of yare with the particle et, yarat, yarat Hashem. Not just reverence of, not just fear of Hashem, but perception of Hashem. How do we perceive Hashem? We perceive of Hashem via His Torah. That's how we perceive of Him. The more one is able to perceive of Hashem via His Torah, the more they are able to contain within their being the anointing of Hashem, the oil of Hashem. That's like the pollinization inside of the actual, uh, in the actual plant. And so this commitment, okay, this containment, I should say, not commitment, but containment of the oil is represented by the Givayim, the cups of the menorah. The greater the perception of Hashem's Torah, the greater the moral discipline, which represents our volition. The outgrowth of spiritual perception and moral volition represents the lateral branches of the menorah. When enough energy is released through the kaftor, remember, kaftor is a compound, a kefit. Kefit means to bind, to knot, and fatar, fatar means to release. When there is enough energy, okay, released through the kaftor, it flourishes with light, with illumination. For a plant, it pollinates, it sends out its flower, it sends out its fruit. This light, friends, allows a person to bring illumination, meaning, substance, to the material world because the lights of the menorah are show, casting on the lechem panim, on the shulchan, which represents materiality. That means the light that a person has can bring meaning to the secular world where Hashem has placed them. They can reveal Hashem in the material world, in the secular world. But you might be thinking, what if you are a soul who no matter what has failed at producing godly illumination, what if you tried and tried and tried and tried and you keep failing? Well, you know what it means? I'm going to be very honest with you. It means that it's an indication that you, like Moshe Rabbeinu and like Zechariah, you don't understand the menorah. You just think that it's an ancient relic that's contained to somewhere in the Torah 2,000, 3,000 years in the past history of the Jewish people. You think it's a museum piece. And that's where you've gone wrong at. Because just as Hashem told Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, He says over there to him, okay? He says, Lo bechayo velo vechoa ki im beruchi. It is not through force and not through power, but through my spirit. Amar Adonai Seva Oats says Hashem, the master allegiance. As explained before, as say for Zechariah, the menorah that the prophet saw was symbolic of God's spirit. And in Isaiah, the prophet explains the nature of God's spirit. What that means, friends, is that our success in this world depends upon God's ruach, His spirit. Not on our IQ, not on our strength, not on who we know, but upon God's Spirit. And so I don't care if you're the wealthiest man in the world, if you're the most popular man in the world, or woman in the world, or you're actually someone who's just shlamil, you're shlamazel. You have no luck at any day of the week. It doesn't matter. If it's by God's Spirit, it's by God's Spirit. You will succeed. And until we eternalize this truth, you know what it is? You know what the truth is? Our menorah is puzzle. Our menorah is invalid because we're not producing any oil. Now I mentioned earlier that the command, that the Torah commands, that the Giviim, the cups and the menorah, they should be in the shape of shekedim, of almonds. Why? Why almonds? Why not something else? Because the nature of a shaked, of an almond, is that it blossoms quickly. And therefore, it denotes earnest, unceasing, eager devotion to one's calling Hashem. In Hebrew, we call this zerizut, or alacrity. This is why Aharon was found worthy of being the chosen Kohen Hagadol when Korach tried to actually challenge him. And God says, you know what? Everyone bring olive or almond branches. And Aharon's branch flourished the most. It flourished the quickest. Because when it came to service of Hashem, Aharon was eager to grow spiritually. And so this teaches us that just as almonds blossom quickly, likewise we must quickly rush to do the will of our Father in Heaven. We must have zerizut. This is why no matter how insufficient a person may feel of themselves, 
as long as they are eager to fulfill Hashem's will, Hashem's Torah, as long as they have zerizut, alacrity, God's Spirit will ensure that they will become a great source of illumination in this world. This is why Yeshayahu speaks of the Mashiach success. Once again, for those who come from a non-Jewish background, Isaiah 11, 1 through 2 is not a passage that describes that the Mashiach is God, as is taught in Christianity and Messianic Jewish circles. Absolutely not. It's a passage that speaks about the Mashiach embodying the symbols of the menorah. He is eternalizing what the menorah means. He is demonstrating to you and me how that menorah is a microcosm. And therefore, through his earnest desire to draw near to God's Torah, he is able to blossom in great spiritual perception and moral volition to illuminate the material world. Many of us, we have the same ability, but it depends on our volition to allow Hashem to crush us in order to produce oil for illumination. And that's why it's without coincidence, as we return to the beginning of this week's parasha, I mentioned, why is it that the actual menorah and the oil was not included in last week's parasha when the menorah was talked about? Why? Because we learned a powerful lesson here. Let's take a look here at Shemot, Exodus 27. Verse 20 to 21, God says, Ve'ata tetzavei is b'nei Israel. Tetzavei is in the imperative. This is urgent. God is saying, command the children of Israel. Ve'yichu elecha. They should take for you, Moshe, shemen za'it zach. Olive oil that's pure, that is crushed. Katit lama'or l'halod ner tami. To cause the eternal light to ascend. It's for oil of illumination. Okay? It shall be Crushed. Crushed. And Masachet Menachot, the sages explain that oil, Shemin, is an analogy for Chachma, for wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is one of the branches of spiritual perception that allows a person to learn and to teach Torah. What is resting on the spirit of Mash on Mashiach in Isaiah 11 too? One of those spirits? Ruach Chachma. Chachma. That's one of the actual Nerot of the menorah. The only way one is able to learn is by crushing any selfish impurities that obstruct them from being able to perceive the Torah. In the same Masachet of Menachot, over in 86a, Chazal explained that since the oil for the menorah needed to be pure, Shemen Zait, it had to have no settlements, no, not settlements, sediments within it. And so to ensure that there would be no sediments, the olives were crushed with a mortar in Hebrew, which was called a makteshet, as you see in your screen. A makteshet. And if anyone has any history with a makteshet, okay, with a mortar grinding things finely, you know it's very excruciating. It's very exhausting. But guess what, friends? In order to ensure that there are no sediments within us, we have to crush any impurities that may lie within us. And just as a makteshit was a device used by hand, we must also labor in crushing any impurities within us. You cannot go around it. This is the way we labor to produce that pure shemen, that pure olive oil for the illumination to ascend for the near tamid. That is how the Ruach of Hashem works in us. He brings the seed that what's in us that's laying dormant that we don't know about and causes it to actually uh, rise, to mature, and in a sense, to the Nehrot, to cast illumination. That way we can take the spiritual understanding of the Torah, that we learn, the perception of Hashem, that can rectify our volition, our morality to God, that we don't misappropriate our bodies, our time, our energy, our money, and we take that light and we shine it upon the lechem, upon the bread that represents materiality, materialism, and we bring meaning to it. We're not just running around here like the rest of the secular world. Oh, wow, a new iPhone, a new Samsung. Oh, wow, guys. And using it for the same stupid reasons they were using the other versions for. Our job is to inject re kosher, kosher holiness into those things. But the only way to do it is how we perceive Hashem. That's why it's important to understand how these vessels are all a microcosm of you and me. And that's also why we should also be inspired to sit down before Hashem's Torah. And like David HaMelech, Hashem, open my eyes to the wonders of your Torah. 
enlighten my eyes with saying the prayer of Ahavad of Ahavad Rabbah, Ahavad Olam. Vehaenu betorah techa, vehaenu. Enlighten our eyes to your Torah. To your Torah, that is true enlightenment. Because when I am enlightened, I have light. I can perceive your Torah. I can perceive you, Hashem. And the more I can perceive you, the more I can understand my function in this world. The more I can bring meaning to the substance of this world. The more I can discipline my nature, my Yetzirah in this world. This is a powerful lesson in Parsha Tetzaveh. And once again, Tetzaveh is in the imperative. It's an urgency. We don't have time to waste because we're not in this world forever. Don't waste another day, the Torah is saying. Hurry today. Oh, you don't like the feeling of being crushed by the makteshet? Well, too bad. You want to experience the illumination of light? It starts with you crushing any foreign sediment within you. Because once you remove any ego, any, any, uh, any type of agenda, then God can work through you. Because it's not about you, it's about Him. And that's why God had to tell Zachariah, tell the Zerubbabel, it's not by force, Zerubbabel. It's not by strength, but it's from my spirit. I will make you prosper. I will make you successful. And therefore, that's why Zerubbabel was to be an example before the people. It's not enough to sit up there with a chumash to teach about this. Oh, wow, this is great information. Who cares? If you cannot live a life and demonstrate to be an example before others, it means nothing. And so I want to challenge each and every one of you out there who's been studying with me over these partial regarding the respective Kalim and the Mishkan, regarding how they are a microcosm. Don't just sit there and think, wow, this is great knowledge. Knowledge is considered a sin if it's not put into action. God is not impressed by our knowledge. What He's impressed by is our, the application of His Word in us. And so I want to challenge each and every one of you to become the source of illumination that God desires for you to be. Don't sit around and say, wow, look at that guy's illumination. Oh, wow, look at Isaiah. You know, that means that the Mashiach is God because it's easier to shift the focus off us because we recognize we're, we're a major work in progress. We're a major balagan. We're a mess. But listen, take that makteshet and start grinding away, grinding away, removing the ego, removing the negativity. And let Hashem allow that pure olive oil to flow through you. Let it ascend. So therefore there's a budding, a prospering of light, a great illumination that you could be an example to other people. That you could be an example and teach them the ways of Hashem. That you can use the resources God has given you in the secular world to bring meaning and substance to many people. Let God use you as that vehicle. So Havarim, I hope that this teaching has been a challenge and it has been a blessing to you. And if we have been a blessing to you, prayfully consider supporting us here at Sulam Yaho. We are a full-time organization and we greatly appreciate your prayers and your financial support. We have the links uh, directly below the video in the description there. If you click see more, you can give via our website or you can give via PayPal. Either way, we do greatly appreciate your support and your prayers. And once again, if you would like to sign up at our subscription services, you can head on over at 70facesoftorah.com and you can sign up for either MP3s or you get the videos, such as the videos you see here. They're downloadable, high definition quality. Also, they come with the PDF notes that you see here on your screen. Uh, you can use those however you want. You want to incorporate them in your own studies, feel free, okay? Or if you just want MP3s, you can get the MP3s of these teachings, and also there's other MP3s. And there's VIP packaging as well because we have other studies that are going up on the website uh, besides just the uh, Parashat HaShivuah, the weekly Torah portion as well. There's studies on holidays, studies for all those other good things as well. Take a look to the website. If you have any questions, feel free to send us an email. And if you have any questions regarding the things you hear me teach here, feel free to send me an email at rabbi at 70 facesoftorahcom I will get to those in the order that they come in. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, let your light illuminate. May the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yahweh be with you. Shalom.